please note that though this is a spoiler-free review of the subject, I do spoil the series and or franchise leading up to this particular entry. I either have or will cover other parts of this franchise and this video either is or will be linked below. I'm not going to restate here what I did or will say in the other video. These videos get long enough as it is. Put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam-pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. Thor Ragnarok movie view. And I think I'll hold. Starting plot. Thor has to stop Hela from causing Ragnarok. And I think that's basically... Yeah, to add a little bit more detail. The Hela is the sister of Thor, and she has been away from Asgard for a long time. And she's returning, and she's extremely powerful, so only Thor will be able to, to stop her, and he won't be able to do it alone. Notes taken during watching. Here we go. Now, this movie is two hours and one minute, two hours and one minute long, and that's if you don't count the end credits, which you should definitely stay through. With those, it's two hours and ten minutes. The, I suppose, oh, so for the, yeah, the, the, in some of the trailers, we hear that thing of, like, Thor explaining, I bet you're wondering, how did this happen? One of the things he says in that portion in the actual movie is I went looking for infinity stones didn't find any the movie gets better the, the, it, it does but at that point I was like okay I get that there's you know this is like a kind of reboot and there it's it's like a standalone they're acting you know for a fact where three of them are. If you had contacted... Xandar is like this big police station planet type thing. Presumably Thor spoke to them. They have one. Then there's one in the hands... Or, you know, the... the what do you call it, like, pendant of Doctor Strange, who is another person that he might have bothered to intentionally contact. It's just, it's, it's that, that line, I just, I feel like that was written by a temp who didn't know anything about the MCU whatsoever, 
and they thought the others thought it was kind of funny so they kept it in I just that line could so they could so easily have had like a thing where like that like if if you're going to do like a you know a joke about that kind of thing it should have been something like you know went out to find out more about the infinity stones and i realized i know where most of them are just that line really wow i don't know it is possible that i misheard and what he said was went out looking for information even information didn't find any that that doesn't work either because of Xandar and Doctor Strange just yeah now the, the very early on you see him in that you know you see in the trailer where he's like hanging from he's he's rolled down and he's like hanging from chains and that scene looks like it's only dramatic in, in the trailer, but in the movie, it's it also has some some comedy in that he's well, he's spinning. He can't. He specifically says, "I'm not even doing anything." It just it keeps spinning, and it makes sense. And that kind of yeah. And it's it's one of those jokes where it's like, yeah, why doesn't that happen? And and it's like this big you know the villain's trying to monologue and such. And it it's one of those things where they very nearly push it too far. It, Maybe there an argument could be made that they do push it a little bit too far, but yeah, the the and there's there's a bit in this where he's like he's gonna do the big you know, he's gonna do that thing where the hero makes a quip and then escapes from this seemingly impossible to escape from situation. And Thor literally, you know, he expects it to work out to the timing, and then he goes, Oh, I didn't time that right. And I'm just sitting there, like, mentally mst 3 k Yeah, but Iron Man 3 kind of did. The, the, this is the exact same gag that Iron Man 3... I'm, I'm not saying Iron Man 3 made it up. It came up with it. But they did it so much better. And... Oh yeah, I am. I am spoiling the other, the movies leading up to this one, this video anyway. You know the the thing where he's like hanging there and he's like, "I'm gonna take care of you right now." Okay, now, and then you know, and after a few of them, the guards are like, "Why do we always end up guiding, guarding some weirdo?" And and the you know just that's so much better than than in this and it's just I get it I get that they want to do the that thing but just if you can't do it better you know it just and and I'm not even I mean the first time I watched Iron Man 3 I absolutely loved it I'm not sure it's as it's it's I think it was Brian on Midnight Screenings who pointed out that it's a great movie Especially if you watch it as like, oh yeah, the same guy who did Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, yeah, it's a hilarious movie. But then when you try to think about it in the context of the MCU, it just doesn't fit as well there. But that's kind of a thing. I feel like Iron Man 3 overall just did a better job of balancing the comedy with the, the drama. In Iron Man 3, the drama has more of a kick than it has in this, but I don't agree with the people who say that there's no drama in this that works, that all of it is undercut by humor. Not for lack of trying. And the opening fight is unmistakably a lot like the opening fight of Thor 1 and 2, and you know, some critics have said that it's, it's a movie that really surprises and it's very in a lot of ways, it's very unlike the other movies, Thor and MCU in general. But then you can also tell what the studio mandated some things. And yeah, this this fight is very much this, yeah. But you can't complain. I love the, the opening fight of all three. That's, that's the thing. I, I do want to say, I really enjoyed this movie. I love a lot about this movie. And... I do think that in some ways it is the best of all three, 
but on the whole, the the family drama with the brothers and father thing, Thor 1 still does that the best, although both of these sequels do a pretty good job with that. Action-wise, it might be the best one. And, like, comedy-wise, I don't know. It is the funniest, but... Yeah, I, th I think that's what I'm going to leave it. Now... The, you know, Scourge, who we, you know, we, we see a little of in the trailers. He's basically taken over for Heimdall, who, whose whereabouts are unknown. And he's like, you know, it's it's a really good intro. He's like, he literally, you know, the introduction is that, you know, Thor needs Heimdall to, you know, the Bifrost, and yells out for Heimdall. And, you know, we cut from Heimdall to Heimdall was a moron or an idiot, something like that. And he's, and Scourge is talking about how, he didn't realize that through this gig you can get like any kind of cool stuff you want and and he's like trying to impress these these two women and like saying oh look at look at my bike and I've got guns and it's, and yeah it's, it's you know for what he does in the story this character could so easily have been incredibly bland and boring and I'm really glad they gave him a personality because the movie would work fine without him having one, but his scenes would be a lot less fun. And and the the you know the soundtrack sometimes really kicks into like songs specific songs and you're like tapping your feet and yeah it's it is not guardians of the galaxy level of that but i yeah i enjoyed it a lot and so did the rest of the pack theater now When when the when Thor goes to Asgard, he finds this huge statue of Loki, and I'm I'm just like, if the Just Cause games have taught me anything, Thor has to strap, uh, you know the 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 head of that statue onto the back of a vehicle and pull the statue down, and that'll help. Now, there's this, there, there's this stage play early in the movie on Asgard, and yeah, it's, you know, it's reenacting Loki's supposed death in Thor the Dark World and like it's not that funny and it goes on for like maybe two minutes from start to finish of what we see of it and nobody in our theater laughed and I realized you know looking up online I realized what the point of it was why we were supposed to find it entertaining and it's because it has three cameos and I didn't recognize them at the time and I don't think anybody else did either and yeah if, if you recognize them you're gonna get a kick out of it but yeah you know, in, in my case it was only 
re retroactive, yeah. In the scene which you already know, the the scene with Thor and Doctor Strange, Thor is like knocking over stuff in the Sanctum Sanctorum, much like how Stephen was careless about things. So so it's you know it's a cute nod to that movie and to this kind of like Stephen is much more self assured now, and I'm really glad that I mean they could. They could have done this with just a few seconds, but no, we actually have, like, if I had to guess, from the moment we first see Steven to the end of the scene, three or four minutes, and yeah, he's, you know, and, and now it's kind of Thor being this kind of, you know, because he doesn't recognize any of what he's seeing so he doesn't know what he can and can't touch excuse me and yeah but it's it's a completely it's a much more self-assured performance as the you know the wizard uh, yeah and the scene also happens very early on so you know I, I I think it was like the abridged script for the One second, what movie was it at the end of? Guardians of the Galaxy 2 movie? I, f I forget, but yeah, and in the in the abridged script, they were like, oh, this is a huge spoiler. Not really. It was just telling us that this is a thing that was gonna happen. And the thing that we were, you know, the, the big reveal there was that Loki and Thor together were trying to find Odin who was on Earth. And this was already a thing that like either Loki killed Odin or he hid him somewhere. That's basically it. All the scene did was confirm Loki hid him somewhere and agreed to help Thor find him. That's all. And in, in the strange scene, you know, we kind of see Strange does what Strange did in his solo movie. He's like, he's moving at his own pace, which can be a little too fast for some people. And like, he's teleporting and shifting and we see it from the other perspective, you know, so we, we're seeing, we're with Thor and we're just seeing constantly jumping between places and things happen and just yeah it's it's a lot of fun it's a really very very good use of the of this kind of thing because I mean Steven isn't really the type of person to just sit someone down and quietly explain okay now I'm gonna do this now I'm gonna do that he's just you know yeah he, he wants to get things done you know and he's maybe not the, you know, he and Thor do get off to just a slightly rocky start with this whole thing. That you, you know, again, you saw the scene. Certain creatures appearing on Earth kind of triggers our radar. Your brother Loki is one of them. You know, it's not like Thor rang ahead and, like, was just so you know. I, Loki is under control. He is not going to do, you know. No, it just and and in walks Thor and he starts knocking over stuff because he's careless. And, yeah. And there's this. Yeah, basically strange. You know, he he traps Loki, and basically after he you know, after after Steven lets him go, because, you know, we, again, we see that in the post credit scene that was part of this scene. Yeah, it's like, you know, oh, sure, I'll help you both find Odin. And, yeah, you know, he unmagics the thing, and Loki comes out and he's like, I have been falling for 30 minutes.
because Stephen isn't especially particular about how exactly he neutralizes the bad guys. The when we meet Valkyrie, literally the first thing, you know, she, we see her drinking a little, and then she literally just falls over. From she like falls, she's walking out of her spaceship and she falls off the, you know, the the little extending thing that you're supposed to walk down. She starts walking, and she falls over because she's that drunk and yeah, and really. There's at least one joke early into every introduction of a major character, pretty much, in this movie. Now... There's this scene early on where Hela is like attacking a bunch of Asgardian warriors and such. And like right after it's over, like she is like looking over the this one and like and Scourge is you know there and he's looking over it and it's just like wow, this is really obviously they're so clearly standing in front of a green screen. It's it's really too bad. There there are a couple of times that that happens and just yeah that really is too bad because most of the time it's not that the when when Thor arrives on Sakaar and is being like you know Valkyrie is like oh he's you know he's a contender he he's like in this little pod and he's being transported and like there's this tour guide voice that's explaining, oh, you know, Swam Master is a really big deal, and you were nothing, but now you're something. It's just yeah. And I love Goldblum in this. He is so funny, so charming. There's that bit of like, you know, at first he just seems like a super nice guy, but then not very long into it, he's like this yeah, he's it's it's that thing of like he really comes off as a dictator. He'll like on a whim just to say, nope, I'm, you know, I'm I'm gonna kill that person. You know, there's I mean, one of the first things he's seen doing is melting a man who is apparently his own cousin, and it's like you know. I pardon you. I pardon you from life. You're gonna be fired out of a cannon into the sun. And you know, Thor is like, what do I really know about this Grandmaster guy? I mean, all I know is that he blew up a boat with one of his own cousins on it. And there's this bit where like Thor is in the in the kind of training air training grounds or maybe to, maybe more like a place where just they're 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 sleeping the the people who are gonna fight and in the in the gladiatorial matches and he like tries to run and it's apparently like a circle so he almost immediately like accidentally circles back around to where he came from and it's yeah it's it's very neo in limbo and the yeah I, um, he he meets this being is this rock being and he's like oh you you look dangerous and he's like oh, don't, don't worry about me i'm not dangerous unless your scissors I guess that joke transcends 
that's spread all across the galaxy. And Yet again, the relationship between Thor and Loki is compelling. I, I really do appreciate every single time the two of them are in a movie together, their relationship is compelling. You know, Thor 1, the Avengers, Thor 2, and now Thor 3. Okay, so it's windy, dark, and raining. I'm gonna have to watch out for lightning. Because Thor might not be happy about everything I say in this review. There is not a lot of cheesy 3D. Honestly, if you're not, if you don't like need to watch every 3D movie in 3D, I I wouldn't really recommend going for it. It didn't really add much. I don't know if it's a post-conversion, but... And there are some times where you can't tell. And... Yeah, I went into some dramatic... a lot of dramatic moments interrupted by a joke and you know again Iron Man 3 just did do a better job of still making some moments be very serious I quite appreciate the action that Loki got to take part in in this and there might not be much left to say in this particular part of the video, so I'm going to try to fill this otherwise dead air. There never really passes a long time without an action scene, which was one of the problems the first movie had, and some of the other, really, a lot of the, yeah, several of the origin story movies, and the action is all great, the climax is really great, both, you know, the, the opening yeah, really, the opening, the middle, and the climax, all really great action. And that's, again, you know, the, the, the first movie had a great opening. And the climax is dramatic, but it's not that, the action of it is not that good compared to the rest. And the second does have both, the second has pretty strong, has strong action throughout as well.
I realize now that I forgot about trying to fill otherwise dead air, but I am almost done going through the notes and finding the ones that are not. Yes, some of the songs in the trailers do appear in the film. The Immigrant Song has two uses. All of the uses of trailer songs in the film are great. That is that. Now, on plot, yes, I am reviewing this close to Halloween night. Why did this premiere now here? Don't know. I have watched every MCU movie, and except for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 and Spider-Man Homecoming, I rarely watch anything in theaters more than once, and it's so recent, so no copy. Guardians does have a copy, but they're reserved until months from now. If I've been quicker, I might have been able to get in time at least twice each. And I did also recently rewatch Hulk 2003, and the first two, yeah, of the first two Thor movies, both Avengers movies, the Iron Man 3 post credit scene, and the Incredible Hulk and its DVD special features. Gotta love how tone-deaf the commentary is when Terry and Roth talk about the favelas. Usually it's rich people who have an amazing view, but here it's the poor people. Yes, I'm sure the poverty-stricken masses living in the favelas are deeply grateful that at least their view isn't as awful as the rest of their existence. I also rewatch the Simpsons Season 7 Episode 19 commentary where Goldblum also has a soul fire on the commentary, but in the episode. And I rewatch The Fly and its DVD special features. It tastes funny. Funny how? Like a clown? Does it amuse you? And yeah, I enjoy Goldblum a lot in those. And honestly, you know, he's he's been in a lot of things that I haven't watched. Oh, he's in Perfume? Oh, uh, not the Tom Tycor one. And I also rewatched Tessa Thompson's Heroes episodes, Terminator 2, since apparently she based some of her performance on Valkyrie on Sarkana from Terminator 2, and Terminator 1, since if you want to watch the second one, you can be absolutely sure I'll watch the first one first. Watch that movie a million times, I could talk forever and never fully express what an unrelenting, intense masterpiece of action horror it is. One of my all-time favorite movies, regardless of release date, genre, etc. Possibly my absolute favorite. The Terminator is easily my favorite of James Cameron's, Michael Bean's, Arnie's, and Stan Winston's, and I've watched a lot of their work. The day I say, nah, I'm not going to watch Terminator, you'll know I've been replaced by a T-1000. I say T-1000 because if it were the TX, you'd already know because the TX would do a flashy transformation in front of everyone, ruining the whole infiltration thing. If it were T-3000, you'd have seen it in the trailer and everyone would whine about how it gives too much away. I already went into that in the video I did on it. Now, the... I watched Zodiac for Ruffalo, which is one of the only two I own. I did rewatch Eternal Sunshine and Spotless Mind recently, though not specifically for this. And Black Panther continues to look amazing in trailers. There isn't an upcoming MCU movie I'm not psyched to see, nor has there been. Now, I did read Planet Hulk in preparation for this, and I may spoil some of it. I haven't decided yet. So I'm just telling you up front. Grandmaster slash Goldblum is not in it, but he does fit, and it makes sense how they put him in place of another character. If I had known that they were also taking elements from these other major storylines, I probably would have tried to read them as well. Now, on the 23rd of 7th, both Thor, Ragnarok, and Jelly released new there we go, trailers. Excuse me. 
The Thor one got me way more excited for the final film than the JLA one, and that continues to be the trend of how the film's trailers affected me. I'm actually a little worried about how that movie will turn out, but, you know, there are bigger things in life. At the end of the day, nighttime begins. Weeks back, it would be two weeks after this premiering that JLA would be premiering, and then this was moved up by a week, so it's three weeks, but nevertheless, you know, which studio made a mistake by the choice to put their show close to the other studios? I think it might be the that the JLA movie is going to be less, like, the JLA movie has a really high bar. Now, like, the thing is, now, anyone watching JLA really early on, like, if they don't like the JLA, you know, that movie, they might just go and rewatch Thor Rangrock to, like, get the, you know, the bad taste out of their mouths or something. I, I, yeah, I, I could imagine that it would still be running at the same time. At the very least, they might be like, wow, I definitely don't want to, I don't need to watch that again after they did rewatch Thor Ragnarok. So, yeah, it's, you know, the, the, people have been lukewarm about Thor and the MCU so far. And as unpopular as the DCEU is with most people, a JLA movie has been a dream for a lot of people for decades, but, you know, the the other movies with Thor are not anywhere near as disappointing as the DCEU movies have been leading up to this. I mean, you might say about the DCEU, well, I mean, Suicide Squad doesn't really enter into it. I still enjoy that movie, but, you know, so that one, yeah, but the other, you know, the first two DCEU movies... Um, I mean, there are, there are some good things about them, but on the whole, they're, they're, they have a lot of problems. And Batman v Superman does end up just not being a particularly good movie, not even that enjoyable of a movie to watch. Like, you know, you can enjoy some trash movies, but yeah. You know, other than Wonder Woman, there hasn't been a lot of real promise for the DCU, and yeah, the fact that, you know, yeah, Wonder Woman's there, but so are, yeah, Batman is also there, and he was one of the, you know, the, the depiction of him. I'm not, I don't really think Ben Affleck was, I think he was good in the role, but the depiction of Batman as this mass murdering psychopath, yeah, but the, Yeah, I suppose that covers it. Now, I was wondering if this movie was going to open like the first two, with narration by Odin about ancient evil, visual flashback to a battle between Asgardians and another ancient race that, since the Asgardians win, haven't been a real threat since then. Over the course of the film, at least some of them will be able to enter Asgard, staying past Heimdall. Time to invest in a new security system. The destroyer wasn't even automatic. If Odin hadn't realized there were ice giants, would they have been able to escape with the casket? It's the sh you know, and and you know, I was wondering if maybe the shield was going to be destroyed or sneak past. Snuck, snuck is no word, Conan. You went to Harvard, and you should know that. You know, are any flying ships gunned out of the sky via big gun emplacements? And you know, this race will be a threat. You know, I was thinking I would love for the opening of this to subvert that. I love the Iron Man 3 opening, and yeah, I mean, in some ways it, it does. Technically, it opens with narration, and then you almost immediately meet one of the major threats. And yeah, I... I I think they did a good job. I think they did sit down and say, how can we subvert the opening of the first two? Because, yeah, at the end of the day, you know, in the, in the second one, yeah, ultimately the, the, 
the black elves just aren't as compelling and they apparently they had like this really compelling backstory which was cut out of the final film because there are so many things you know I mean it's not a long movie but there are a lot of elements in it and yeah I can I can see why they decided not to add in all that stuff but without it they're just kind of bland and just yeah where you know I, I get it the ice giants were a tough the, the thing with the ice giants isn't so much the ice giants themselves they're they're fine but the the whole thing with Loki and how he reacts to the ice giants and ultimately I do agree with I believe it was what the flake that said at the end of the movie suddenly we're supposed to care about the fate of the ice giants when up until that point they had been the antagonists you know the 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 movie opens with two big fight scenes in both the the ice giants are taken out by the dozen and clearly a threat so yeah you know it's it's um it's a good subversion but it doesn't work as well as it could because they they haven't been present for a little while in the film and yeah we were never really they weren't established as being as having innocence among them they were established as just being a bunch of warriors who but yeah this one does not do that same thing and it's it, yeah it's a verse it's somewhat and I greatly appreciate it now for those who don't know Ragnarok is a Scandinavian's versions of the way that you know the 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 end of civilization or the extinction annihilation of the world so to us it's like the movie is end of days uh, Armageddon and um, apocalypse now end of the world now now Taika Waititi described the film as like 1970s and 80s science fiction fantasy and you know comparing to like Big Trouble in Little China and you know he also talked about how this it's kind of this buddy road movie kind of thing and I don't know enough about road movies to fully understand it, but I didn't I don't completely see it I feel like if it were a road movie there would be more being on the road like if road trip is a road movie then I don't see how this qualifies that movie has like a dozen different stops along the way and like they change yeah stuff stuff but in this it's just kind of after a while of the movie they travel but they don't go to a bunch of different places but I do definitely see this kind of buddy cop you know and, and just in general buddy dynamic of, of this you know they don't always get along and you know neither of them is like a saint heaven knows now excuse me Now, based on the Maven of the Eventide's analysis on the what we do in the shadows, you know, the director's previous work, you know, the, there are complex, compelling characters struggling with their circumstances, and interesting interpersonal relationships between them, and yeah, he put that here as well, and you know, it's not, it's there's there's already a lot of room for that kind of thing in the Thor series. You know, the first two did that as well. But yeah, he was a good fit. I, I don't think he went too too silly or too comedic too much of the time. But it does get close. I'll definitely admit that. I think the 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 movie definitely have a, has a Guardians of the Galaxy thing going on. 
I'm not sure it's quite as good as the first Guardians of the Galaxy. I, I think there are elements where that's also a movie that really manages to properly set up, okay, this is going to be serious, and oh, oh, un undercut by a, a joke, and where, you know, ultimately in this, you're constantly just waiting for the joke. It's, yeah, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy is a movie that also has a lot of scope, and some really disturbing material, and in this one, stuff that could be disturbing is ultimately joke material. I do think it's better than the second one, and certainly a lot more... I, I said in my review of the second one, sometimes it feels like it's the first movie, but ten times bigger. And that is way, way too much, and scenes that, like, in the first are really enjoyable because they're so brief and so surprising we didn't expect that to happen in the second one we know well you know obviously this is going to happen because it happened in the first and everyone loved it there and so they make it 10 times bigger and and yeah sometimes that is entirely too much and again i'm not saying the whole movie is that thankfully it's i maintain that the second guardians of the galaxy is a great movie but i do think on the whole this is better than that, but again, you know, soundtrack-wise, it's not, it's not even trying, not at all. Now, 80% of the dialogue in the film was improvised in order to create a very loose and collaborative mood, yeah, mood, and... Taika Waititi describes Ryan Ross's reinvention, and, you know, yeah, it is like, it's not just this big thing of like, there are times in the film where it legitimately seems like, oh, this is, this is a disaster movie, basically. This is about how we just barely survive, and ultimately it's not really that... Yeah, it's, it's, there's, there's, it is that thing of sometimes when something is destroyed, something else is built, and, yeah. And, you know, in the trailers you see this, the fighting in one of the fast-paced trips between worlds and the rainbow bridge shaft, and this is the first time something truly unique has happened there, you know. In the first movie, we see that it's there and it's established and you know then we see some times where it doesn't happen surprising characters and leaving them seemingly stranded temporarily stranded then in the second one we see Jane travel along it too I'll get to Jane now that Thor won't one of my first crushes so it's yeah Natalie Portman is stunning. That's yeah. Now the the I know it's it's superficial, but she it's, yeah. Anyway, yeah, you know it's 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 a really new and cool kind of thing to do it, and someone might just get knocked out of the shaft, and if that were to happen, we'll see what happens from that. Now, some critics say it's basically a screwball comedy. In At times, definitely, yes. Now, this is where I get political, so if you don't want to hear it, just skip to the next segment. So the largest oil spill since the Deepwater Horizon spill in 2010 hit, just hit the, you know, has hit the Gulf of Mexico. I may have said this before, but I don't mind repeating it. Since the people who make the most money from oil don't think these spills are a problem, I'd like it made policy that whenever a spill happens, they have to hold off on a certain something. Using water not polluted by oil. For anything at all, until the moment they spend the amount of money it'll take to clean up the spill. And if they violate this, they have to pay a fine that takes a huge bite from their profits, say, 10% of what they've earned in the last year or so. And if that proves to not be enough to motivate them, you know, we can gradually go up 
taking increasingly big bytes, increase it by 10% each time. Maybe add another year. Yeah. And it's telling that Bill O'Reilly wasn't bothered that women were harassed, but that it was becoming public, that it was hurting the image of him, of Fox News. Characters, heroes. Now, Thor is, you know, kind of a lone gunslinger in this, and yeah, you know, he's supposedly been trying to learn more about the Infinity Stones, but yeah, I mean, ultimately, that was an Age of Ultron, so that he would be moved further along. You know, part of it was getting him away from Earth. And, yeah, in in this, they don't actually do anything with that. Like I already mentioned that it's just this hand-waved away of thing. Yep, didn't find any. I just... <laughs> they're they're gonna do something there in Infinity War. Unless they decide to just say, you know what, let's just go with, he doesn't really know what's going on with them and stuff, I don't know, but I mean, you need at least one character who does know, and I can't think of anyone else already introduced who would really have I don't know, I guess what what was that thing about how like when Infinity War takes place, it'll actually have been years since the events of Guardians of the Galaxy 2, so I suppose it's possible that one or more of the, them are actually now experts. And yeah, Hemsworth wanted to do something different and he spoke with director and, and, and Kevin Feige and they all agreed that they need to, need to do something different. <coughs> Excuse me. And yeah, and that leads to a number of differences. And and several of them wanted to do this whole kind of thing of having him be funnier which works quite well, although, again, I really do think that the whole Infinity Stone... Honestly, if they hadn't mentioned it at all... If, you know, in, in again, in the scene, he basically just says, you know, I went out looking for these things, I didn't find any. If he had started to say, I found out about these things called Infinity Stones, and I went out, and then immediately it cut him off. I would have preferred that to what they actually did. Or just have him say, although, you know, yeah, have, have him say something about that the MCU hasn't heard before. You know, I was going to say, just have him say, you know, there are these incredibly powerful stones. The people who've been watching already know that, but yeah, you know, just have him have an indication that he has learned something. And, you know, I mean, you could just have like another character be like, yeah, whatever, and then it doesn't get brought up again. But yeah, I, I, I don't understand how the. how they ended up with the line they did, but yeah. Now, yeah, as you know from the trailers, Thor and Hulk will have a rematch from Avengers 1. So two heroes will fight because at least one of them is being forced to. What is this, Batman v Superman? And, you know, I was wondering, I mean, Hulk doesn't have hard feelings from Age of Ultron. You know, he might have towards Black Widow. Tony, maybe, but he and Thor didn't clash in that movie at all. And... You know, a lot of people will go to this movie in large part to see the two fight. And it's 
Uh, it's an okay fight. I mean, I will say that both of them get to deliver big blows that really, yeah. It is not the Hulkbuster fight. I'm sorry. It, it you know, I'm sorry, but they opened the door. They, they, it's, it's two Avengers fighting each other with, with, you know, it's, it's another Avenger fighting Hulk and he, you know, and there's some sense that he's like somewhat prepared. I mean, if you had like Hulk fight Captain America, you know, there's no contest. As strong and fast as Cap is, there's nothing he can do against, you know, Hulk just like that. And, you know, Black Widow, she just tried to outrun Hulk. And, yeah. I don't know. I, I feel like if instead of the two of them fighting each other, if it was like, you know, the, they fight the, the guards forcing them to fight each other instead, but any, anyway, it's a, it's a reasonable fight scene, and certainly, and, and it does, that is, again, something I really appreciate, it does have a clear winner to the fight. Which we, we really didn't in Avengers 1, which is also part of why, you know, there's no point in, like, there, was been, there would be no point in having another Hulkbuster fight, Hulk versus Hulkbuster fight, because that fight ended and we had a very clear winner, although it was a hard one victory, but at the end of the day, you know, Iron Man did win. It's, that's, that's not like... It, it wasn't like some kind of Deus Ex Machina, but no. Tony did manage to stop Hulk by beating him in that fight. And yeah, you know, Thor is now wearing a helmet. You know, in Thor 1, there's actually on the DVD a deleted scene where Thor and Loki joked about each other's helmets briefly. With Loki going nice feathers and Thor responding, you don't really want to start this again, do you, Cal? I was being sincere. You are incapable of sincerity. Now. But yeah, you know, funny Thor, we, we don't have, he's not being very serious and taking himself very seriously here. For very much of it, at least. And certainly there are serious situations that he responds to with sarcasm. And... You know, Thor hasn't gotten to really kick loose, use his powers a ton, fight and defeat other powerful beings from start to finish of an MCU film, and... Yeah, ultimately this doesn't really change that since, you know, it's... It's him similar to the first one, being in one or more situations he can't easily fight his way out of. And, I, I mean, at the end of the day, that's that wouldn't allow for so much drama. It would still be really cool to see. Actually, yeah, they could probably get drama in there from in other ways, but, yeah. Now... In Thor 1, the... And Avengers 1 and 2, I love all of the Asgardian lines. In Thor 2, there are at least a few of them I don't love. In this one, I love all of them. Now. In the first film, when they try to get some blood for testing, Thor does not take it well. He actually goes through that every time he gives blood to. Now. I only know Hemsworth from the MCU films, which does make up 8 of 23, as well as A Perfect Getaway, The Cabin in the Woods, and both Snow White movies. Now, Hulk... Let's see... That's reiterating... But yeah, you know, as Ruffalo stated, he's much more of a character than the Green Rage Machine you've seen in the Avengers movies. He's got a swagger, he's like a god, and he's in perma he's been in perma hulk mode for two years. 
and in doing so formed the vocabulary of a toddler and yeah you know in in the first before he couldn't really he either couldn't or he just didn't particularly speak and be like coherent which in the comics yeah well, I'll, I'll get more into that but yeah here he actually does the, there are a few conversations between him and Thor and in the trailers you see almost nothing of what this Hulk is actually like just brief conversation bits and such and I think they did they did some interesting things with it but I feel like they could have gone further but I'll get into that in the thoughts section but yeah you know right when I saw the the Comic-Con trailer 2 finally they feel comfortable letting Hulk actually talk not just a couple of words but entire sentences even if somewhat short and you know the the before this his personality was almost only expressed by his physical actions and you know Though his vocabulary was limited at first, he talked right from right at the very start of the comics. And yeah, you know, there may have been times where he didn't talk for entire comics or barely. I haven't read all of them. But he did talk with what he said making sense. It was often fairly simple, but it was there. You know, it's not just this. Yeah, you know, and. and some really early ones he's talking about how he's just misunderstood he doesn't want to hurt anyone he just want to be left he just wants to be left alone yeah that actually you know in the movies it's really just been banner expressing that he wants to be left alone so he doesn't become hulk so he doesn't break things and there wasn't really much of an indication that hulk understood that as well you know, it it might have been that once he turned into the Hulk, he might just do any, yeah, except for Banner having a certain degree, excuse me, of control or being able to guide him towards, yeah. You know. But, you know, he, he did say a little in both of his solo movies and the first Avengers film using his vocabulary from the comic. Maybe people responded poorly to that. And, yeah, Mark Ruffalo I've seen in The Dentist, which does sound like a comic book villain name, and in that he punches the maniacal dentist, proving that even then he had stones like a Thanos gauntlet and serious anger issues. Turn Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. My first thought when I heard they cast him for the Avengers was, that doofus dancing on Jim Carrey's bed with Kirsten Dunst? 13 going on 30, where he is made to play the boring adult version of the charming and quirky child character Matt. Collateral, Zodiac, the science bars don't get along in that one. Shutter Island. And, yeah, when, you know, I forget, I think it was a comment on like a, maybe the abridged script of the first Avengers movie and some point out that when Thor and Hulk are together, Thor often gets turned into a joke, becomes the butt of jokes. You know, Hulk punches Thor away after they take out one of the giant alien snakes, as an example. And to be fair, Hulk probably wanted to get him back for their fight earlier. But you know, yeah, some in this Thor is a joke, but you know, Hulk is also sometimes the one being made fun of. But yeah. Man, the world really must be ending. Hulk is in a non-Avengers film. Except for between this and Infinity War, Hulk continues to only be in a film every three or four years. And this is no longer a reboot every five years each time. Now. You know, in, in, in Age of Ultron, it seems like Hulk can't turn back into Banner without Black Widow. And she isn't here. So, yeah, and that does get, that's that's something I really appreciate. That continuity-wise, yeah, Thor actually tries that. And 
yeah, you can imagine it maybe not going so well. But Thor tries that with the with the same words and the same phrasing and really trying to yeah. Now and we do see more of Hulk hating and fearing puny banner. Where you know Age of Ultron didn't really delve into it. it you know, it had a few occurrences of it. Now, you know, parts of Planet Hulk are adapted in this, and it's a story they wanted to do for years, preferably as a solo Hulk movie. And you know, doing it like this fixes some of you know one of the worst parts of that story that. These good people, heroes, close friends of Bruce Banner, choose to exile him to space as a solution to Hulk's volatility. Him making the decision himself makes it a lot better. Exile's still a bad decision? Maybe. But everybody makes mistakes when they try to do the thing that seems most beneficial. At worst, this makes him kind of emo versus it making his closest friends monsters. And, you know, maybe if this movie does well enough, Planet Hulk will be turned into a solo Hulk movie. And before you say, well, in this movie, we already know how Hulk's part of the story on the planet ends. Well, by that logic, we should never do prequels at all, which is, of course, wrong. We shouldn't do prequels because they almost invariably suck. But just because you know how a story ends doesn't mean it can't be interesting to get more detail on it. That's why Shakespeare's plays have been performed for hundreds of years, with few of any major plot changes. And, you know, Hulk has had some tragedy, a sense of fatalism, it being inevitable that he will lose control, be a threat to innocence, possibly even people he cares deeply about. You know, to his... Yeah, so his character in both solo films and both Avengers films, and this has some... Honestly, I think there should have been more, and that's again where I think Iron Man 3 thing and Guardians of the Galaxy thing, you know. Guardians of the Galaxy, suddenly you actually feel, wow, this, you know, little talking rodent actually has this serious emotional... Yeah, you know. That's, yeah, ultimately, in this, it's too eager to go for punchlines with every character. And with Hulk, that's really obvious, you know, and he, yeah, there's, there's a scene where, like, he and Thor are, like, arguing, and Hulk, like, throws heavy objects at him. And, and I mean, that's not, that hasn't been played for laughs in the other movies very much. And I do think that it's fair to, certainly the comics do that, but it'll, I feel like it didn't have enough of the dramatic scenes. And, I mean, he's finally back. He's finally in a movie that isn't an Avengers movie. And the Avengers movies inherently can't completely go into it. I mean, in this one, there, you know, Thor's like, oh, we're forming a team. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could call it that, but there aren't that many of you, and several of you already have really big parts, so the the remaining members can still have a lot of screen time, where, yeah, the Avengers movies, there's not that much screen time for some of the supporting players, and certainly, they can't just straight up have, you know, that's the thing, they do try to have the, they, they do have some legitimate drama with the Hulk thing, but it's through Banner. You know, it's not Hulk speaking and expressing that he's frustrated with the situation. It's Bruce talking about how worried he is about f turning into the Hulk and how he doesn't like what it does to him. You know, the, the Hulk is a separate character and has been in these movies. I mean... Yeah, yeah, the the solo one as well. The the first solo one as well. Every single one of these movies has treated the two of them as different parts. It's not just that like Hulk is actually Bruce, but he's suddenly really stupid and really easily provoked. No, it is a different person. It's a different personality. And Finally, we get some screen time for this personality without him spending all this screen time breaking people and things, and I really feel like they should have pushed it further for the drama. Now, 
And yeah, the trailers don't really give a sense of Hulk or Banner being sad, which he was in Age of Ultron when he left the team. And it would make sense if that was what motivated him leaving Earth, everyone and everything he knows. Now, Hulk is a scary horror like movie horror movie like monster or Wolfman or Jekyll and Hyde and parts of Hulk 2003, parts of the Incredible Hulk. A genuine threat but with a lot of funny moments in both Avengers films. And yeah, here it's, you know, like I think a lot of funny moments and you have some sense of like the tragedy. Really, he's not a threat for very much of it. And I mean again, part of that is that he's been Hulk he's been in Hulk mode for two years. He can't just constantly be going around breaking things. Now, outside of Hulk 2003, every single time you see Hulk, it's memorable. Every Hulk out is epic. And, I mean, yeah, and this, you know, parts of, are just more or less him sitting around or you know, arguing with Thor, where really, I mean, if he was, if he was human-sized, yeah, if it was just a human being, it would more or less be, the the same thing it's it's important in the action scenes and yeah that covers that since in the incredible hulk blonsky is supposedly on the super soldier serum and hulk and black widow are up against each other in the avengers the only member of the original mcu avengers that hulk hasn't fought in some way is hawkeye And Thor and Hulk fought mostly hand to hand with Mjolnir by throwing each other around and with a few objects thrown in the Avengers. And now they both have medieval style handheld weapons and, you know, not so much, you know, easily reachable objects to throw. And yeah, they fight a little differently. And it is, I mean, that's something I'd say. I, I would definitely say this isn't, it's not the same fight as in the Avengers. It's not. It's not the same as any other action scene completely. You know, part of the thing with the Hulkbuster armor was that it was specifically designed to have a series of different things it could do to try to, as Tony put it, go to sleep. You know, make make Hulk go to sleep. And yeah, this this isn't that. You know, Thor is strong and fast, but he's not... yeah. So... I do, I do think that's, yeah. Now, Mjolnir has had many great moments in the films leading up to this one, and a pretty good run, and I, I support them taking it away now, mixing up the status quo, disempowering Thor somewhat, forcing him to rely on other talents, weapons, tactics. Now. Odin was replaced by Loki, whose apparent death was to trick him. But I guess he didn't see that, did he? He will pay for it in Odin's name. And... Let's see... The, the thing with... You know, the... the the gladiatorial fighting. There, there's like discs implanted in, in, in the comic it's like in their chests. In the movie it's basically like the, the neck and yeah they can be electrified by remote. So somewhat like Fortress or a reality show. And you know in the comic Hulk befriends other gladiators and one of them's a Cronin like in Thor the Dark World and I was wondering if maybe that was him. Maybe that's why Hulk's furious, but no, it's that's Korg and in the comic, and he is in the film with the director doing mocap, and yeah, I, I quite like the, you know, it's it's this thing like he's really soft spoken and calm, and you know, yeah, he's a big guy made of rocks, but he he's he doesn't want to harm anyone. And there's a scene in the comic where Hulk imagines the Avengers and others laughing at him. Most of the characters in that bit are actually in the MCU now. You know, Doctor Strange is one of them, for example. So, you know, if they had done the the 
Planet Hulk like before Age of Ultron, for example, you know, they wouldn't have been able to do that scene as closely to the comic. And I I don't know exactly how to pronounce it, but Miek yeah, I th yeah. What I'm saying is, I forgot how they pronounce it in the movie. I think it's Miek. The the yeah, you know, he he doesn't speak, but yeah, he's he's this kind of larva creature with cybernetic legs and arms, and yeah, his journey as a character in the book is one of the most compelling aspects, and I'm really glad to get to see him on screen. But of course, they dumped a ton of that, you know, and that's another thing. If they actually did this as a solo movie, the the I, I feel like they could delve more into some of this stuff. Excuse me. Characters, villains. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, Kate Blanchett is great as Hella. Now, finally, we have a female villain in the MCU, and I don't think. I mean, the the question is, you know, is she? Actually, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll get I'll get to that. Now she does channel Dark Galadriel in some of this, and yeah, I've seen her in, you know, both the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit trilogies. Bandits, Heaven, Hot Fuzz, I'm Not There, Robin Hood. I have watched Ponyo, but not dubbed, only in the original Japanese. And, you know, she looks a lot like she does in the comic. And the question is, is she another of the few memorable MCU villains, like Loki, who's, you know... They're, they're both quite compelling in this, but I would say that Loki remains more compelling. You know, Ultron and Kaecilius are really the ones... There's a lot of compelling aspects to her, and she really is... You know, I did not expect for there to be as much backstory, but... Yeah, the... the there's more family drama there, and that is a thing that... I mean... At the end of the day, the second Thor movie did not introduce another sibling, which this does. Hela is the sister of Thor and Loki. And I don't think that the second movie needed to because it goes into what came, you know, the, the consequences of the Avengers, the first movie. And, you know, in this one... You have the consequences of him, you know, hiding away Odin, and then you have this other sibling, and I don't feel like it made the movie be overstuffed. But, yeah, I mean, ultimately, part of it is also that there are, you know, some of the other things going on. Like, in the second movie, a big part of it is this whole convergence thing, which, you know, and, and the ether, and yeah, I mean, in this one, there isn't really the, the, the thing that Thor is dealing with for a bunch of the movie is getting from Sakaar to Asgard to stop Hela. And Hela is on Asgard, and we there, even before, even, even without the, her spending a lot of time with her siblings, she's compelling, and they go into her backstory and why she is so vengeful, as she very clearly is. Now, Carl Urban is really great as Scourge. I've seen him in Ghost Ship, the Lord of the Rings movies he's in, Born Supremacy, Red, Dread. Maybe you should have kept going in that direction, that kind of naming convention made tread, retread. 
And now the right villain, the right hand of the villain is not Curse, but Scourge. If the first villain have gotten in on that name trend, I guess it had been called Ursic. Now, excuse me.